Hey, welcome back to The Urban Monk. Dr. Pedram Shojai here talking about one of my favorite subjects in the world, which is hiking. Uh, in particular, we're talking about hiking long, long miles and really spending a lot of time back in the backcountry. Um, I did a fair amount. I mean, you know, I consider the High Sierras my, my church, if you will. And uh, I did a fair amount of backpacking on an annual basis before I had kids. Uh, and uh, the last kind of big trip I took was the John Muir Trail uh, back in 2012 uh, in the filming of the Origins movie. We ended up doing it in uh, just over two weeks uh, and it was a couple hundred miles in two weeks and it was just you know about 16 miles a day with a bunch of like camera gear and a bunch of stuff so you know no it wasn't fun but it was beautiful uh, and so there's a whole culture right there's the there's the John Muir Trail which is up up here but then there's the Pacific Crest Trail which the John Muir Trail is a part of that runs you know basically it's from Mexico to Canada the other famous one in America is the Appalachian Trail. And so my guest today, Robert Moore, uh, basically uh, took off after grad school and got to do the five-month Appalachian Trail. And um, I've met a lot of people that have done these types of adventures, and I felt like it was appropriate to bring someone who can speak about it onto the show to really contextualize what life can be like. And you know, five months from now, you're gonna be five months older either way. Uh, or you could decide to go hike the Appalachian Trail and have a life-changing experience that will, you know, always be with you. So, you know, let's have an adventure. So, uh, without further ado, Robert, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. So, what what drove you? I mean, you're in Brooklyn. Uh, you'd finished uh, grad school, and then suddenly you're like, "Yo, you know what? I'm gonna do this thing." Yeah, I'd, I'd actually finished undergrad. It was in between undergrad ah. and grad school. I'd, I'd gotten into the grad school, but I had this break, this really neat break, because I knew I had to be at school in September. And and I had, you know, I was working a freelance job for this uh, subsidiary magazine of National Geographic. And it, it was, you know, just a kind of a, a step above temp work, really. And so I didn't have a whole lot holding me down and holding me back. And I knew that if I didn't take this opportunity, once I got into the flow of grad school and then hopefully out of grad school, you know, getting a job, I would be in that uh, sort of rat maze of life and I, it would be harder to take this break. So I saw my little glimpse of sunlight and I, and I took it. Good for you. Uh, we were talking about this uh, before the show started is, you know, you got to have some sort of interlude in life. You don't just like say, you know, hey boss, I'll be back in five months. Like that, that's not, that's not, you know, how reality usually works in the working environment. I mean, people do take sabbaticals. There are opportunities to do so, but you know, so that pause between, you know, the undergrad and grad, that's a great time to do it. You know, career pauses. It's like, you know, I've, I finished this job. I'm moving to the next one. I need some time. Um, what, so what is it about taking five months to hike? That's transformative. Yeah, I think with the with the Appalachian Trail in in particular, it, it's always had a history of people doing it as a way to take a step back from life, from from you know their their sort of conditioned life at home, and to instead go out and uh, reassess things. So the very first guy who hikes the Appalachian Trail is a guy by the name of Earl Schaefer who had come back from the war and he, he was actually trying to, I think as he calls it, walk off the war. And that's something you see a lot, mm. people returning home from Iraq or Afghanistan who have some things they need to sort through and maybe they don't wanna go through traditional therapy and they have all these skills, right? They, they can hump a pack for you know 20 miles a day and that's not something that's really valued uh, when you get back home. And so you see a lot of soldiers, you see a lot of college graduates who are kind of lost, you see a lot of People who've just gotten divorced or who are just retired. You see a lot of people in their in their sixties out there, uh, who you know are, are all at the at the point in their life where they're thinking, "What's next?" Um, and so I think it's something I look into a lot in my book is what the wilderness symbolizes for us as a space that's separate from you know the civilized, cultured, whatever you want to call it, the world of human. Uh, that human hands have shaped. It's the, the wilderness has always been defined as the out there, the beyond the fence. And in that space, a lot of things can take place. You know, it's a lot of religious cults are founded out in the woods. People, you know, have orgies and do drugs and bury bodies. All sorts of stuff happens out there. It's a free, unconstrained space for good or ill. 
And one of the things that's happened out there over the last three, four hundred years in, in Europe and the United States, especially in, in Canada, is people have made it into this kind of um, wilderness temple or place that we go to commune with nature and to re-examine ourselves. There's this secular spirituality to be found out there. And for some people, it's not secular at all. It's, it's highly religious. I met, you meet a lot of uh, evangelicals out on the trail as well. That's interesting. So just to kind of set the table here, you're not going out there with like a bow and arrow, you know, and hunting beaver, right? Like there, you know, this is, this is, most people aren't living off the land for five no. months doing this. You're, you know, mailing food ahead and all that. So let's talk about the kind of logistics of, of making this thing happen. Yeah, well, so as an interesting side note, there's actually one person who uh, is sort of lays claim to having hiked the Appalachian Trail while hunting and gathering. You, you may have heard of him. His name's Eustace Conway. The, there's a book about him by Liz Gilbert called The Last American Man. And uh, I was so fascinated by this notion of hiking the Appalachian Trail and hunting and gathering the whole way because it's uh, having done it, I knew how difficult that would be. And I went out to interview him, and, and he kind of admitted to me, well, yeah, I mean, I had some oatmeal and I had some some packets of mac and cheese and I would, you know, bum food off of people who are passing by. So yeah. he wasn't really, but he was, you know, he would see a porcupine and he would run up with a stick and he would bash its brains out and he would cook it up right there beside the trail. And <laughs> he was foraging for wild food. But if everybody who did it tried to do that, it would, you know, of course, it would be impossible. I mean, already it's it's not, there's barely enough wild food there to, you know, to subsist upon while walking 20 miles a day. I mean, that's what I was amazed by is that you could cover the mileage and spend the time to set a trap. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, what I did was I, I dehydrated a lot of food. The, the biggest challenge I think about the Appalachian Trail logistically is nutrition. I mean, obviously the hardest challenge is, is mental and then physical, but a lot of what plays into that is people allow themselves to get malnourished because you're just eating crap that you find in grocery stores. And the, the stuff that you can find that cooks up really fast is ramen noodles, Pop-Tarts, you know, stuff like that. And, and that's a lot of people I saw just subsisted on that the whole way. Instant mashed potatoes. You know, these are all hiker staples, through hiker staples. And I didn't want to live off that. I did some research and I, I knew that wasn't going to work. So I cooked up a whole lot of healthy stuff, quinoa and brown rice and whatever, black beans. And I dehydrated it. Uh, you can actually make a delicious pasta sauce at home, t tomato sauce, and dehydrate that. And then uh, bagged it all up and mailed it to myself to post offices along the trail. And so I would, every five or six days, I would you know, hitchhike into town. I'd go into the post office. I'd pick up my package. I would then go to the grocery store and buy all the good stuff, you know, cheese and whatever that I wasn't going to mail myself. But I used that stuff I mailed to supplement the diet and get a little bit more whole grains and I had, you know, vitamins I mailed myself and all sorts of stuff just to try and stay you know, mm -hmm. healthy and somewhat happy. And even then, it's really hard going at the burn rate of 16, 20 miles a day and not getting malnourished and not getting into like, you know, catabolic state where you're breaking down your own muscle. So it's yeah, just a matter right. of time before, you know, you, you, you are all, you know, you, you're on your way out at a certain point. So then it's just a question of, you know, are you going to make it to the end or not? Yeah. And I saw that again and again, you know, my, my book, just for your, so your listeners know the book is uh, a book about trails. It's called on trails because I'm looking at different trails of all sizes. So I start with tiny insect trails and fossil trails, and then I zoom out um, to game trails in the forest, and then, you know, uh, ancient indigenous trails and modern hiking trails. And one of the people I was following in my book was a guy named Gil Jackson, who's a Cherokee guy, who's one of the first, he, he thinks he's the first full-blooded Cherokee and maybe the first full-blooded Native American guy to ever hike the Appalachian Trail. And I watched him, I, I met up with him, I'd actually met him on, for separate purposes reporting the book, and then he wrote to me and said, I'm, I'm through hiking. And so I met up with him in Vermont and New Hampshire, and he'd been eating what he thought was very healthy, and which was very healthy food and, and very traditional food, a lot of you know, dried venison and dried you know, jerky and, and dried fruits and things like that. Um, but he was in his 60s, and I watched, I could actually see the point where he just broke physically. He said, he, he said I, I cannot do it anymore, because he was so malnourished, and his feet were just in terrible shape. And, you know, while I was with him, he said, I'm, I gotta quit. I'm, I'm gonna go home. 
And the most beautiful thing happened. His fellow hikers who he'd been hiking with, which was this motley crew of you know, people he'd met along the way, some kids in their 20s and 30s, all came together and said, you know, here, first of all, here's some food for you to eat. You know, eat this jar of peanut butter. <laughs> Get some mm -hmm. fat in your system. You'll feel better. And second of all, give me your tent. You know, let's share. And they and they really lifted him up and ended up getting him those last 150 miles uh, just through teamwork, which is another thing that people don't mm. often realize is that that communal space on the Appalachian Trail can be really beautiful. Oh, yeah. I mean, there there are people. I mean, listen, you're, you, you are with three, four people maybe uh, for hundreds of miles, you know, there's nobody else around. You're in the wild. I mean, there's bears, there's stuff. And so, you know, people become, you know, like, I, I often marvel at this because, you know, I grew up in LA and there's just people everywhere. So people become people averse, right? It's like, ah, shit, there's just, you know, traffic and, you know, all these. When you're out in the wilderness and you've been going for three hours and you've not seen a, a single human and then you come across someone on the trail, you stop. You say hi, you ask what's coming, you tell them what's behind you. You know, it becomes this really pure form of human interaction that I think has been lost in, in urban settings. Yeah, that's true. It, 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 and there's also a, a level of, you know, it's funny. Er, when I was leaving to hike the Appalachian Trail, I was living in New York and people would say to me, aren't you worried about getting murdered? Aren't you worried <laughs> about getting, you know, um, it, it, are you worried about hiking alone? But there's actually a great deal of trust that that's built in to hiking because it's a self-selecting group and and right away you just you all have something in common and you're all out there as you said kind of without a safety net and so you you band together mm -hmm. really quickly. I'm I'm someone who has a lot of natural trust in other people and and obviously also I have this you know force field of white male privilege around myself so I can you know I go through into these dangerous situations with a, a little bit more. Uh, a little bit less anxiety, but I like to, you know, I hitchhike, I, I go on these long hikes and I don't, uh, I've never, I mean, I've had a couple of hairy, you know, run-ins, but never, n overwhelmingly 99% of all the interactions you have out there are positive. Yeah. It, it actually restores faith in humanity in a lot of ways. Like you just, you get to understand human nature and like just that story of, you know, the tribe carrying his weight and giving him food and getting him across the finish line. I mean, that's, that's compelling. Like they don't have to do that, um, but that's, no, no. That's what. And, and, you, and you run into these people along the trail called trail angels who do that for the whole summer. They'll go out and just help people with for no payment, you know, no expectation um, of reciprocation. They just go out and do it because it makes them feel good. It's a mm. kind of you know gift economy, and everyone's paying things forward. It's it's really nice. Yeah, you know, it's interesting is we would know the PCT through hikers, uh, you know, a, a mile away when we'd see them because they're just like, fuck, man, got to go, got to go, got to go. You yeah. know, they're just they're yeah. just hoofing. You got to put in the miles. You got to yeah. put in the miles. And then when you finally yeah. get to a place where you've like, you know, kind of engaged with them, it's the same thing. It's like, hey, you want some food? Right. Because yeah. you're like, yo, I'm doing 16 miles, but you're doing this for five months. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's funny. I've also uh, I've spent a little bit of time in monasteries in in India and in Burma, you know, as, as a Theravada monk, and and I often thought that there was a similar that you fulfill a similar role, and that people, when you're a monk, you go around on your alms round, and people feel good. You know, it's it, it's a it brings you good karma. It's it's a it, it's a meretricious act, but it also just feels good to give to to the sangha. And it's the same with these with the hikers. When I'm out there on a day hike or a weekend hike, and I see a through hiker passing through, it it just I I love sharing food with them. It it because you know that you know through hikers say nothing tastes better than food you didn't have to carry. You know that <laughs> it's totally. the it's the sweetest calories, uh, and and it's absolutely true. And so I you know for example when I met up with Gil Jackson, then I would mail him uh, these care packages along the way afterwards and. He, he, he was just, you know, you're just so much more grateful. You're in this open and and uh, receptive mode that allows you. I mean, I even had people give me cash. I'd be hitchhiking, and someone would just give me twenty dollars. And I said, I don't, I don't need it really. Like, I'm okay. I'm not going to spend it in the next five days. I've got enough money to get me to the end. But they just wanted to give you something to help you along because they feel that you're doing something big and significant to you. And so, yeah, it just it's a it's a kind of reciprocal form of giving. That's really sweet. That's, you know, again, you know, it's, it's 
hard when you listen to the news today to not have a pessimistic view of humanity. And so it takes experiences like this to really remember what humans are about. I mean, there's so much goodness that one encounters yep. in, in situations like this. Um, you said something in the book that I found compelling. You said, well, when we eat, we convert living matter into waste. And when we walk, we create trails. So then mm -hmm. the question we must ask ourselves is whether we, we, is not whether we shape the earth, but how. Yeah. And this is obviously the kind of the, 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 the ongoing theme in your book. So let's talk about trails. Let's talk about the creation of trails and what, what that is and how that becomes, you know, our, yeah. our wake. Yeah, I mean, that, that realization was one that I came to from, it, it's kind of hard without going into a, a, a great deal of detail, but I think we all grew up with this assumption that there's this thing called humanity and there's this thing called nature and there's been a schism and you know now we need to somehow get back to nature and that everything we do there's a natural way of living upon this planet which leaves no trace which leaves no marks and then there's our way which is hugely destructive and i agree with the latter premise i think our way of living is hugely destructive but i think it's a fantasy to think that we and it's it's and it's an unhelpful fantasy to think that we can live in a way that, that is not in some way shaping this planet. In fact, the planet is the communal shaping of all the species who live upon it, right? And so when you shift your thinking to that, it's a kind of a subtle thing, but when you shift your thinking to that mode, you start to see how we need to work together with other species in order to create a planet that we all want to live on. And, and trails are a, a really beautiful, elegant uh, manifestation of that because animals of all kinds share trails, they work together on trails in order to navigate the complexity and the chaos of landscape, right? If, you, if you're trying to get from here to there and you stumble on a deer path, that deer path is probably gonna lead you through the lowest path, pass through the mountains and, and across the shallowest ford across a river. And in fact, that's how many of our trails were formed. People following game trails, which then became roads and then became our, our road network. Yeah. And so that's a, I, I love that idea of us working together. Of course, it can also backfire. If you're a hunter, if you're an animal that's hunting another animal, oftentimes they will follow, they'll evolve to learn to recognize trails, follow those trails, and then hunt down their prey, which, which of course, we do as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a different story altogether, but that's also a part of our history, right, is you, yeah. you, you're looking for food. Um, you know, it's interesting, like I, I did back in, the, back in the days, you know, I used to read a lot of Tom Brown Jr. and kind of did a bunch of kind of wilderness yeah. survival stuff. And so a lot of the kind of narrative around that is, is treading lightly and, and really, you know, knowing your, your wake, knowing the imprint of your footsteps on the substrate and just, just being a lot more mindful of how you, yeah. how you trudge. Um, when you go on to say the John Muir Trail now, there's so many people ever since, you know, there's been a couple movies and lots of books and all this, and same with the Appalachian yeah, Trail. The wild effect, yeah. The wild effect. There's just, you know, there's so many people going through there and they all got to take craps, you know what I mean? Like they're all like right. peeing. And so, so it yeah. actually becomes an issue because, you know, everyone wants pure unadulterated nature and everyone right. wants to take a dump in the woods. And you're like, no, actually yeah. there's an outhouse now. Like right. <laughs> wa watch that, right? Because the yeah. wake is also that, right? Everything that you've yeah. eaten, um, you're also putting back there. Yeah, and that's that's an interesting challenge. I mean, some places like I've climbed Aconcagua in Argentina, and you have to haul out your waste in a garbage bag there. You know, they, we have different approaches to it, but but one of the ways in the, I mean, so the whole Leave No Trace movement is really a, a, an outgrowth of the fact that in the 70s, you just had too many people hiking at once. It, 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 we, we needed to find ways to minimize that impact because if everyone wanted to just go their own way, camp where they wanted to, which is the way that we used to go hiking and camping, right? In the, in the 20s and in the 30s, people would go out and they would cut down a tree and they would build themselves an A-frame and put some pine boughs on there and they would, you know, that was camping. And, and it, was, it was very natural in one sense, but it was also destructive. Uh, incredibly destructive. Yeah, yeah. The, your, your footprint was huge. So Leave No Trace was this effort to minimize your impact. But part of what that means is creating, like one of the Leave No Trace principles is ca travel and camp on durable surfaces, right? And so sometimes you've got to create durable surfaces. You have to build trails with gravel treadway or you have to build tent platforms. And a lot of people don't like that because it doesn't feel natural. Mm -hmm. But it is actually the best way of concentrating everybody's use in one area that, rather than spreading it wide and, and destroying more of the landscape. And so it's, it's ironic. Yeah, sometimes we, 
we love certain places so much that we end up changing the nature of them and in the process making us love them less. Yeah, I mean, and we see it reflected in society. I mean, I can't tell you how many friends I have who live in Austin, Texas, say, who are like so pissed that that town got cool, right? right. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it, it's, it's the same principle. It's just like, yeah. damn it, now LA's here, right? Yeah. And, and so, you know, that continues to be, you know, reflected in everything that we do. But the purity of that transaction, of your interaction with nature, um, it's just, it's unparalleled. I mean, for me, like I said, I mean, I can't, you can't go any further by saying, you know, that's church to me, right? Yeah. And so I, I love it. And so yeah. for my listeners and viewers, if, if they're interested in, say, hiking the, the AT or the, the JMT or the PCT, any of these trails, mm. what advice would you give them? Uh, well, I have a couple points of advice. Um, and these are maybe a little bit controversial. My first piece of advice I always give people is I would say hike from south to north, which is the traditional way to do it, from Georgia to Maine. Uh, there, are, there are growing numbers of people who do it in the opposite direction, which gives you some advantages. You can leave later in the season. You can leave in June rather than March. But uh, ultimately, I think the topography is is destiny in that sense. It's just it, it's it, it's such a beautiful progression going from Georgia to Maine. I often say that going from Maine to Georgia is like starting out in Mountain Doom and hiking back to the Shire. You know, huh. it's it, it's anticlimactic. You end up because Maine Katahdin especially is just this fantastically raw, rugged, tall mountain and. And Georgia is, has some hot, big mountains, you know, relatively speaking, but they're kind of rolling and green. It's, it, you don't get the same views. So I would say do it the traditional way. There's a reason why people do that. Just um, maybe leave it at a less conventional time. I'd suggest people mail them, dehydrate and mail themselves food like I did. I think that worked out really well. Um, obviously, the biggest one is get your pack weight as low as possible before you leave. It's the biggest mistake I see people make again and again is they leave with like their uncle's old L.L. Bean backpack and their big leather boots that they've had since, you know, their high school outward bound trip and their big old Walmart sleeping bag. And then they get on the trail and immediately realize it's way too heavy. You can't do 20, 30 miles every day with that gear. And so then they have to go to some outdoor store along the trail, having done no research, and have some guy sell them whatever the guy wants to sell them because they don't have any, you know, they just don't know what they're going to get and it's more expensive. So do a lot of research, buy stuff online before you leave. It's an investment, but it, it'll pay off in the end. Yeah. Um, one of the things, then, one of the things yeah. sorry to interrupt, one of the things that we had when we did the JMT was, you know, we all had some sort of like hybrid hiking boot where it's just like, okay, I got these waterproof boots and, you know, yeah. the, you know support and blah, 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 blah. And, no. you know, one of our guys who's like an internet nerd who just like actually sat down and did research, got those kind of the, the Brooks like trail shoes, trail that runners, were, the yeah. trail runners. And we're yeah. like, dude, sneakers? And yeah, it was like everyone was everyone was envious because guess what yeah. happens every time you take a step? You're lifting yeah. that damn thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's every almost every through hiker makes that transition. I I don't know of any. Maybe I know one guy who did the whole trail in those heavy leather hiking boots. But that's something that we learn when we're kids, right? We go out and hiking trips, and they make us wear those big boots because we have heavy packs, and we have heavy packs because you're probably using some tent that like your summer camp lent you or whatever, it, it, but it's all relative, right? And so if you have a bigger pack, of course you need heavier boots, but if you can get your pack weight down below 20 or 15 pounds, uh, what they call your base weight, which is just, you know, everything except food and water, then you don't need those hiking boots. You can right. wear running shoes and the, and the runners are so much better at drying out. I mean, you, you see, you, people think they need waterproof shoes, but no shoes are waterproof. Ultimately, they all get wet. If it's raining, you're always going to get your feet wet on the inside unless you're wearing, you know, Gators. something that's so water repellent that it makes you sweat <laughs> more than the rain gets you. So just let your shoes get wet and then dry them out. And the trail runners dry so much faster. It's I wouldn't even bother getting a Gore-Tex lining or any of that. I mean, that's I think that's a scam, those Gore-Tex running shoes. Just get lightweight runners with good support, good tread. Um you'll be fine as long as you don't have too much stuff on your back. And swap them out, right? Like, you you know, these things, yeah. a lot of people don't realize four, that yeah. you got you got miles on shoes that expire, right? So, you know, when you're putting, what, so if you have 40, 50 pounds on your back, yeah. how many miles is a pair of those, you know, good for is, you know, I, I, don't, I don't remember the conversion at this point, but like you need new shoes at some point. 
Yeah, I think I went through three or four pairs, and I was actually using these. These they were ultra light. They were basically high top trail runners called by a, a company called END, and I don't even know if they exist anymore. It was a kind of sustainable running shoe company that was really cool, and I think they may have gone out of business. But uh, I had I bought a couple pairs of those on sale and mailed them mailed them to myself along the way, and they would yeah they wear out and you you just burn through them because you're you're doing so many miles per day. Yeah, it's it's a thing. Um, and so, sorry, I interrupted you. You were also going to drop another piece of wisdom, uh, you know, after that. Oh, well, the last one is this, and this is especially true if you're a, a writer or someone who likes to record your thoughts, is, is to bring uh, a recorder, a separate recording device to, uh, to record your thoughts. Because I had a little notepad I brought and I had it in my pocket, and I would have to stop and write down, you know, when I had a brilliant idea that I didn't want to forget, I would stop and write it down, and it became so frustrating that I just stopped stopping. And so if you, what I've learned over the years is to bring a little recorder with you and do a kind of note to self along mm. the way, you can record so much more detail, so many more memories. Because the other thing is when you get into camp at the end of the day, you, you, know, you set up your hammock or your tent and you're tired. You don't want to write in your journal. And my mm. journal is just like uh, useless. It's, it's just a description mm. of what I ate <laughs> that sure. night and how much my feet hurt. It's like you cannot summon the mental energy necessary to describe all the beautiful things and all the funny anecdotes that you're going to want later. Even if you're not a writer, you're just going to want to remember that stuff. So if you can record it while you're walking, uh, that's really useful. And also, I think a lot of people find their brains work better when they're walking. It's when we have our best ideas. There's something about the rhythm of walking and thinking that go hand in hand. Yeah. And the tech has really changed too. I mean, look, I mean, I, I don't know if I'd use like an Apple Watch because it can't hold charge in town, but you know, yeah. have something that actually has, you know, a real easy accessibility. Um, yeah. Because you're right. I mean, like, you know, and, and people go back and forth with like the, the walking poles and all that, but it's like you got yeah. enough shit on you, right? So it's, yeah. it has to be easy. And if you, every time you stop, it's taking yeah. wind out of your sail. So, right. you know, and, and, well, and that's why, I mean, when I did the trail, we didn't have iPhones. Like, I, I mean, maybe a couple of my friends, this was 2009, so maybe a couple of my friends had iPhones, but it, by no means was, were they as pervasive as they mm -hmm. are now. On the trail, it's really weird because, you know, when I was, it, I mean, I feel like an old man because I, when I hiked the trail, everyone would stay at night with their headlamps writing in their journals. And now everyone sits in their sleeping bags and they type on their iPhones. It's, it's almost universal. And also everyone has enough cell coverage to where they can update their Instagram and Twitter and whatnot. So that's something that's really changed. And my friend, I have a friend named, uh, sort of writer friend named Rahawa Haile, who's written some really great stuff about her through hike last year. Uh, and urge your, your listeners to, to look her up. Uh, and she, I believe, did most of her notes on her phone and wrote all of her journal entries on her phone and, and did maybe some voice memos as well. So... I don't even know if it's necessary to bring a separate recording device yeah. anymore. If your iPhone can hold enough of a charge and not die for five days, which I'm not sure it can, but yeah, yeah. that's, I mean, the iPhone is just a, an incredible <laughs> hiking tool in that sense because you can, it's, it's, it's all in one. It's, it's the greatest yeah. Swiss Army knife ever It's made. a beast. And, and you know what? Like what I did with my, in 2012, I had iPhone. And so I would keep it on, you know, take off Wi-Fi and airplane mode. And you get all the like, you know, signal yeah. waste stuff out because you're not, you don't have any bandwidth. But then you have it for pictures, really handy. You have it for voice memos. And then you also, I had it like apps that would help me identify like, like, you know, flora and fauna and stuff. So yeah. I'd be like, yeah, what's yeah, this flower? Really good. And yeah. it's just like, hey, you know, here's the answer, right? And it would be yeah. offline so it wouldn't have to, yeah. you know, access the internet and stuff. And yeah. so, yeah, you, you could do a lot. Um, you could do a lot with very little now with the tech that we have. And what a, what a great use of tech, right? Like if you're sitting there trying yeah. to check your Twitter feed, then, you know, you've probably yeah. missed it, right? Right. Um, but it, it really takes some discipline. I mean, it's, an, it's a debate that's going on right now in the outdoor community is, is whether they should extend Wi-Fi and, and cell service into national parks, whether the National Park Service should be taking it upon themselves to make sure you have a Wi-Fi signal while you're in, you know, Yellowstone. And I'm kind of against it. I still like the wilderness as a refuge from connectivity. You know, that's one of the themes in my book is that trails are a, a connective uh, structure as well. And trails become roads, become railroads, become telegram wires, become telephone wires and the internet. I mean, it's all sort of one and the same of information mm -hmm. flowing easier and faster across the landscape. And the wilderness is a kind of refuge from all of that. 
Uh, and so it's a question, do we want to, on the one hand, have all that great stuff? If you have uh, better, if it's easier for you to identify plants, if, and if it's easier for you to call for help, then maybe it is worth it to extend the Wi-Fi into the wilderness. But on the other hand, we're losing that refuge sense, that sense of yeah. wilderness as refuge. And it just, I don't have that much willpower. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, yeah. we took a satellite phone because, you know, we had all the camera crew, insurance, all this kind of crap. So I had a satellite phone and, you know, I, I made a point of not using it as much as I could. Although my, when my wife found out I had it, it was just like, why aren't you calling me? <laughs> right. Yeah. And so you have this whole like tethered thing to, to society again. Uh, and yeah. yeah, I mean, look, people do fall. People crack their heads. I mean, there are life threatening emergencies, but there's also yeah. a network back there of like hikers that will then go communicate with the ranger station, which is, you know, 10 miles down the, the, the yeah. trail. It, you know, it, it usually works out. Right. And, yeah. and that's how yeah. that's how it used to be. Your neighbors would Come to your aid. Exactly. Yeah, we figured these things out before <laughs> before cell phones. There are, there are ways to not die. One of the most interesting people I talked to in regard to this is this old hiker named Nimble Will Nomad, who's right at the end of my book. He's a guy who you know made a lot of money. He was an optometrist and uh, was doing pretty well in Florida. And he, he went and hiked the Appalachian Trail, got to the end of it, kept hiking along the International Appalachian Trail. Which go, went back then to, uh, to up uh, it, up to this place in Quebec, and he was it was like four thousand miles. He wrote a book about it called Ten Million Steps. This, that's an unbelievable journey, and he loved it so much that he never really stopped hiking. So he came home, gave away almost all his possessions, gave away his money to his wife and kids, and started walking. He did all of the national scenic trails in America, so the AT, PCT, CDT, Ice Age Trail, all of them. Then he ran out of those, so he just kept going and started making up new ones. And uh, so I wrote to him and I said, I'd love to hike with you. And he doesn't like journalists. He's kind of a cranky, conservative guy. He didn't like the writing I'd done for environmental magazines. So he was not interested in talking to me. And I said, I really love, I mean, you just, he's such a fascinating person. And so he said, all right, if you can find me, I'll be walking on this stretch of highway in Texas on this day. And I said, all right. And I flew down to Houston where my sister lives and we drove out along the highway and there he was on the side of the road. And uh, I got out and he said, well, you found me. And so we walked together for three days. And one of the things that surprised me most about him was that he, he's a fanatical minimalist. He's the, he's the most intense minimalist I've ever met in terms of hikers. He has no toothbrush. He only uses a toothpick. Uh, he carries no, uh, I mean, o almost nothing, no books, no, you know, obviously nothing like that. No toilet paper. He only uses water. And he's, if he doesn't have water, he uses his own urine. Uh, he has, he just has nothing in his backpack, but he has an, uh, an iPod and a cell phone. So not an iPhone. <laughs> he has an iPod and a cell phone. Uh, and, and he carries them both because I don't know why he doesn't have an iPhone. He doesn't have very much money because he gave all his money away. So it might have something to do with being yeah. a pay as go plan. But he likes to, he said, I like to call. He has a girlfriend. He says, I like to, uh, you know, after all these years, he's in his late seventies. Like, I don't want to be away from her that much. And, and it's also a safety thing. He said, she made me start carrying it, but now I like carrying it. Yeah. And the same with the, with the uh, iPod, he goes into McDonald's every once in a while and he catches up on his emails and he said, you know, it's really about finding a sense of balance. You, you can't cut yourself off from all these things altogether because there's a lot of good that they offer. So you just have to learn to use them in a balanced way. And he said, I, I think I found that balance. Yeah, it's funny because you have this kind of fundamental pendulum swing that happens by people that are overwhelmed by their tech. So then they yeah. want to like go out and be in a loincloth and like, you know, yeah. try to eat squirrel. And it's just like, yo, yeah. okay, let's, let's start with a hike. Right. right. And, and so yeah. once you've spent some time out there, you really appreciate what an iPhone can do. And yeah. frankly, you know, if you're still looking at like wedding gowns on Facebook, you're lost, right? So like, you know, it's, yeah. it's the tool is what it is and yeah. it doesn't overwhelm and crowd your consciousness. So the book is yeah. called On Trails uh, and Exploration by Robert Moore. It's a Simon & Schuster title. I think it's uh, coming out soon, uh, 4th of July, from what I see yeah. here. Paperback is out 4th of July, that's right. Excellent, excellent. And so... Um, but actually, I would urge your, your listeners, if they're listening to this now, go on, go on Amazon and get the hardcover because it's on sale right now. It's like really cheap, so Hell it's yeah. actually... 
good deal. And I love hardcover. I just it's just so much so much better. And I you know I'm gonna actually do a, a trip next year. We're doing one trip with uh, my buddy Matt going through Indonesia and doing like a 16,000 foot mountain. And then I'm gonna do some kind of backcountry stuff and, and try to maybe take a few people from our community because like I said, this is church. I just, it's such a powerful thing for me. Um, having kind of grown up spending, you know, hundreds of hours, you know, out there, that it's really hard to explain unless people have kind of gone out and, and had a wilderness experience along these lines. It's it teaches you minimalism, it teaches you stick to itness, it teaches you, you know, it, you know, it's it's Zen in its finest, right? Like you are yeah. breathing and stepping and, and listening to the breeze and paying attention and you know, there's so many things that it can do for you. And so I, I highly recommend it. Uh, check out the book, let me know what you think and hey man, thanks for writing it. Thanks for doing what you're doing. Uh, we're, we're out of time and, you know, I could talk with you forever about this. I mean, we'll have you on for a part two, catch up, uh, catch up with your, your next projects or so. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, keep on, keep on doing it, man. I just, I, I love, I love the culture. I miss the culture. And so vicariously through you, I can, uh, you know, at least appreciate some of it through your book. Let me know what you think and I'll see you next time.